Fantastic! You have decided to attend your first debate tournament. My name is Tony Nielsen. I'm the executive director of the Bay Area Urban Debate League, and I'm here to talk to you about what it means to attend your first tournament, to sort of get you ready for that briefly. I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I am going to try, over, try to cover a lot of things from both a coach and student perspective so that you can feel like you're ready. Um, and then before you know it, you will be winning these. You'll be coming home with the hardware, as we call it, in debate. All right, so uh, before you can do that, though, you have to be ready to go to the debate tournament. So we're going to cover several steps. Before you can attend a tournament, you need to register for the tournament. Registering for the tournament means basically telling the tournament that your school and your debaters are going to attend. And there are typically registration deadlines. So you would want to read the tournament invitation or ask the tournament host what the deadlines are. So when is the latest that I can add? Almost all tournaments are online entry these days, which means that you will need to sign up on a website. That might be speechwire.com, which is what the Bay Area Urban Debate League uses. It could be tabroom.com, which is another uh, computer system we use, or joyoftournaments.com. These are places where there are tons of high school debate tournaments. So you'll need to go register your team, list yourself as a coach, and then you'll add your students into the database so that you can add your students to tournaments quickly and easily. Now it's time to register. So you've actually signed up for speechwire.com. You've received an email that says, congratulations, Skyline or Kip King or Richmond High School. You have been invited to the Bay Area Urban Debate League Fall Classic or Fall Championship or March Madness, whatever the tournament name is. Uh, so now what do you do? So as a coach, you're going to log in to the system and you need to put your debate uh, debaters into pairs. A pair of debaters, two debaters, equals a debate team. All right. Uh, so debater A and debater B become a debate team. And now they are, you know, formed for life or, you know, maybe a tournament. Uh, <laughs> sometimes we go through lots of different debate partners. Debate partnerships are a great thing. It's how you learn to work with other people and in debate, which is, you know, an intellectually, uh, you know, pushing activity. It, it pushes you mentally. It, two heads are better than one. So it's good to have debate partners. And when you go into a debate round, there'll be two debaters on the affirmative and two debaters on on the negative and they'll be from different schools so what you're doing when you're registering is you're pairing up all of your debaters right so debater a is going to go with debater b and then you're going to put them in a division so division is based on their uh, skill level which is really how long they've been in debate so in the bottle we have four divisions that are possible the first one is rookie and it means first debate tournament only First debate tournament only. So if you have had, if a student has had more than, uh, if this is not the student's first debate tournament, then they do not go in rookie division. All right. Uh, the second division is called novice division. Novice division means first year of debate. All right. So they get two semesters or six tournaments that they can spend in the novice division. And sometimes our debaters debate for a semester and they go away and then they come back. They're still novice until they've spent a whole year in novice division. They are welcome it's perfectly legitimate for them to stay in novice division. Their second year of debate is called junior varsity, and they can spend the entire second year, same process, six tournaments in the junior varsity division. And then after they've completed their JV year, they go into varsity until they graduate. Um, and, and that's how the process of debate works. Now, in terms of partnerships, when you're pairing people up, what if you have a junior varsity debater, but you only have novice that you can put them with? They have to go into junior varsity. Uh, you always put them in the division of the most senior member of the debate team. Remember, a debate team is two people, right? That is our debate team. Our debate squad is all of our debaters. So uh, what registration is asking you to do is it's asking you to pair your debaters into debate teams and put them in a division. And you're going to do that for everybody that is attending the tournament. Um, and that's how we know how to prepare, how many rooms that we need, how much food we're going to need, how many judges we're going to need, right? Because at the tournament, we need one room and one judge for every four debaters for every round of the tournament. And so registration is where we get that information.
getting to the tournament, you will need to arrange transportation for your students via bus, carpool, or parent drop-off. Always have a plan for each student. Know when the students need to be at the tournament. It's at least a minimum of an hour before their round start, if not at registration. Uh, contact parents and ask them what their plan is. If you're with the league, make sure you get the bus schedule if we have one. In order to have speech and debate tournaments, we have to have judges. Not this kind, or this kind, but more like this kind. So, judges are really parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, teachers, friends, and volunteers. So, uh, the truth is that in most leagues, judging is an obligation that schools are required to provide because that's how tournaments function. At Bottle, we ask that you help. You know, ask around, try to help us find judges. So, what is the requirement? For every two debate teams you bring, we need one judge for the entire day. And for every five to seven individual event speakers, depending on the tournament, they also need a judge for the entire day. So where do these judges come from? Well, they come from our network of friends, which is why you should help. What makes them qualified? They're an adult, they're helpful, and they're awake. Usually there's on-site training or directions, but we also recommend you help them out. Great, you've registered for the tournament. Now what? So I want to go over sort of like what the day looks like over the course of the day and what some of the expectations are. Every debate tournament has a different schedule. Uh, the bottle typically sends all the coaches a schedule for the day. And you should make sure that you've sent that to all the parents so that they know what they can expect. And you should go over it with your students so that they know what they can expect. Uh, because once you're at the debate tournament and you're registered for the debate tournament, you are registered for all of the rounds of the debate tournament. All right. Uh, you don't get to come in for a one round and then leave. And when you do that, it wrecks the competition because the competition is based on whether or not teams are winning or losing. So if your teams are winning for two debates and then they leave, all right, the other teams that were winning are supposed to debate the winners. And they've already knocked students out of trophying at the tournament. Your students have knocked people out. And that was unfair because your students aren't going to finish the tournament. So they shouldn't have been there. Of course, we make exceptions. Every now and again, a debater gets sick and they have to leave or something tragic happens and they have to leave a tournament early. These things happen. But we prepare our students to come to a debate tournament and debate all of the rounds. Uh, so that means you need to know what the schedules look like and you need to go over it with the students and you need to make sure that they send uh, that you send that schedule home with their parents as well. So they need to know what the rounds are. Usually rounds start early. They start as early as 8 a.m. And uh, typically the bottle finishes around 7 p.m. Uh, but some debate tournaments go very late until 9 or 10 p.m. So please make sure that you check the invitation and you check the schedule so that you know what you can expect. Uh, high school debate tournaments have a very hard time staying on time uh, on their schedule sort of in general and there's a lot of reasons for that we're not going to get into that in this video but it's pretty common for a high school debate tournament to struggle to stay on schedule typically though you should expect that they'll finish within an hour or so when they say they're going to all right so what are the expectations for you so the bus is going to pick up you and your students and the expectation is that you're either going to ride on the bus with the students or you're going to ride behind the bus in your car uh, and follow it to the tournament, right? But basically the expectation of a coach is that you're going to be with your student, not just as chaperone, but also helping guide them over the course of the day through the debate tournament um, and, and, and through their arguments as well. Uh, so I'll talk about that in just a second. So you're going to get on the bus or you're going to follow the bus and then you're going to get to the tournament. When you get to the tournament, you're going to double check your registration. You're going to make sure if all the students you listed as coming are actually here. And if they're not here, you're going to immediately go find the tab room. Tab room is the nerve center where we pair up all the debates on our little computer and they, they come up. And uh, this is what a pairing looks like. Let's talk about how you know who and where to debate or the postings or pairings as they're sometimes called. So here's a pairing. Uh, at the top is the division, novice, and below it the start time, round one, 9.15. Now you'll see the judge, the room, one team, and its opposing team. So you basically read it straight across. Now not all tournaments do this way. Sometimes it's team, team, room, judge, or some variation. This one is varsity division. Now this is where the postings are. They're in a public place where all the kids can come out and see it, usually taped up to a wall. 
All right, so we just went over the pairing, and so that's what the pairing looks like, and that's why we need your registration so badly. So make sure that you tell us if there are any changes to your registration. Do you have any students who you need to change? Like maybe partner A is now going to debate with partner D, and, and, you know, they were supposed to be A and B together, but now it has to be A and D together because, you know, C and B didn't come at all, or, or C got really mad at D and now has to debate with G, right? Any changes that are going to happen, you have to tell us. Any drops that are going to happen, you have to tell us. And... Any ads? Hey, you know, uh, it turns out debater uh, X and Y said they weren't even going to come to the tournament. And then I got here and here they are at the bus this morning. So now I have to have them added to the tournament. All of those things must happen immediately as soon as you get to the tournament. That is the last step of registration is letting the tab room know about any changes that you have. And that's ads, drops, or alterations to the pairings so that we can produce the pairings and the tournament can start debating in round one. And every time that gets delayed, that's one of the reasons that uh, high school tournaments don't run on time is we didn't get the changes made in time to alter the pairings in order to keep things on time. So, uh, we went over the pairings, so you have an idea of what that is already. All right, so all of that has happened, and all that's happened, and now the pairings are out, and they're posted on the wall. And the next thing you need to do is get your students to the debates. All right, uh, make sure that they go to their debates, directly to their debates, um, and that, you know, everybody gets to their debates as quickly as possible, um, and, and then everybody does their debate rounds. And if you are a coach, you might have a ballot. You might need to judge. And before you think you're unqualified, please note that at a high school debate tournament, we have so many rounds happening that everybody who is an adult is qualified. Everybody. We get volunteers from all over the place. They are sometimes, you know, have no educational background at all. You are a professional educator. You are super qualified to judge a beginning debate. And if you're like, oh, no, I'm not then there is a judge training that always happens during the first round of a bottle tournament and you should take that judge training because you almost certainly have to judge uh, we really need people to judge so let's answer a couple other questions about the course of the debate of the day uh, but Tony my students say that they're not ready no one is ready for the debate tournament Guess what, my friend? Literally nobody at the debate tournament is ever ready for it. It's not really a thing that you can be ready for. Uh, you know, we go over the packet as best we can with our students. We go over arguments with our students. Sometimes a student just learned debate the day before, and here they are at the tournament, and they're sort of learning it shotgun style over the course of the day. Uh, all of these happens in the, things happen in the Bay Area Urban Debate League. Uh, it's perfectly normal. Nobody is ever ready. They're all just fronting like they're ready. And the basic motto that I give all of my novice debaters and have for the last two decades is fake it till you make it. Uh, pretend like you know what's going on, even if you don't. You know, make sure that you take the speech order or handout sheet with you into the round and fake it till you make it. All right. Uh, Tony, how should I dress for the debate tournament? Most debate tournaments are kind of like a business casual affair. Um, you know, you don't have to wear a suit and tie. That's not necessary. You probably shouldn't roll into the tournament, though, in your pajamas. Uh, but at the Bay Area Urban Debate League, we really don't emphasize uh, clothing. We emphasize arguments because, you know, we all come from different places in life. And so I don't think it's productive to tell a student that they need to get, you know, a new uh, new suit or tie or, or dress suit in order to attend the tournament. I um, mean, you know, as long as they look like they're ready for day of school, they'll be fine. Can the parents come? The parents can absolutely come if they want, but they can only watch debate rounds if it's okay with both teams, right? It's not only their child that's in the room, there's other children in the room. So uh, it needs to be okay with everybody. Mostly, we would love it if parents would judge. Uh, so if you have a parent that's just got to come with their student all day, great. Put them in the judging pool and let them judge. We are in desperate need. We promise they will not judge their own child. As a matter of fact, they will not judge anybody from uh, their child's school at all. Is there an audience? This is one of my favorite questions. Students are always really afraid that there's going to be like 40 people watching them. <laughs> there is not going to be 40 people watching them. Um, everybody at the debate tournament is debating at the same time in round one. So if there are 200 students, uh, that means we have 50 round ones happening, right? Because you have two debaters that go in that are affirmative and two debaters that go in that are negative. Um, and then you have a judge that comes in to judge that debate. So you have five people basically in the room at a given time. And the, that's it. I mean, everybody else is busy. Everybody else is running round one and we've got every judge, you know, in a debate and there's not an adult to spare. So there usually are not uh, audiences in the room. Um, and, and 
And that is, you know, sometimes there are a couple of kids that will go watch because they got a bye, which means they didn't have an opponent. There were an odd number of teams in the division um, or their other team that they were supposed to debate forfeited. And so they'll go watch. But again, that's always based on whether or not everybody in the room is comfortable with it. You, you can't just walk in and say, well, I'm going to be here. Um, you have to be comfortable with that. All right. So is there an audience? Not really. Usually your judge is your only audience. Uh, what do I do at the end of a debate round? At the end of a debate round, you should shake your opponent's hand and thank them uh, for, you know, having a good debate round with you. Uh, you should thank your judge because they're almost always volunteers giving up their Saturday to come listen to you debate because they believe in the power of youth voice, youth leadership, and youth vision. Um, and so it's really nice if you thank them for their day. And then you head out of the room and go back to where your team has set up a meeting point. I recommend that all teams set up sort of a rally point where they'll come between rounds and the coach will be there uh, so that they can talk to their students and sort of check in with them over the course of the day, right? Take their students to lunch, make sure they get their breakfast or, or whatever, all right? Um, and then, you know, basically wait for the next set of pairings to come out and then immediately go to your next round. And that's kind of how the course of the day goes. And once all the rounds have happened, then you'll go to the awards ceremony and we'll give out all the awards and it will be spectacular. But that's basically the community expectations for what happens over the course of the day. One question that I think is really valuable is what should coaches do? What am I supposed to do when I'm at the debate tournament? You know, Tony, I just learned speech and debate two weeks ago, a week ago, last Thursday. <laughs> what do you expect me to do while I'm here? Well, the first thing is uh, to help the tournament by making sure that your students are checked in, that their registration matches who's actually there to debate, um, and, you know, that you have your students' phone numbers right there so you can call them if they're missing or if there's an emergency. You know, you're the adult. You, you have to be the one that's prepared to contact them. You're the representative of your school. Um, and to make sure that they get to their debate rounds on time. Because when they don't get to their debate rounds on time, the tab room, which is, you know, making sure that the tournament runs, they're going to call you and they're going to say, can you find me, you know, this person? This particular woman is missing. Can you help me find her, please? And so if you have, you need to have all your kids' cell phone numbers so that you can help find them. All right. Um, that's kind of what you do to help the tournament run logistically. And there are other things that you can do to help the tournament run logistically. You can judge debates. Uh, you can get involved in the running of tournaments, which is like picking up between rounds or making sure that each round has started. Uh, we call that being a ballot runner and checking off, uh, making sure all the ballots are in and then making sure all the debate rounds are started. You could work the ballot table. You can work the registration table. You can help us clean up afterwards. You can help us with the award ceremony. <clears throat> All of these are things that we have volunteers do. The bottle staff is not big enough to do every one of those jobs, and we absolutely depend on coaches who are members of our community to work together because that's what it takes to run a debate tournament. It takes a community of people who care. Uh, it, it can't run with just one person or five people or even seven people doing it. Um, it takes a whole community to care about the debate tournament. Um you know, so if, if you're interested in any of those jobs, contact me. But you should definitely expect to judge because we always need judges. We just do. We get to round three and four after lunch and we need judges. Um, and, and you are a qualified educator. Uh, you know, the next thing that you should do is you should talk to your students between debate rounds. Set a rally point for your students. Like we are going to meet uh, outside of the, you know, uh, Jimmy John hallway uh, right out in front of room 201. Now, if there's debates happening, then you probably don't want to have a big meeting in front of 201. Um, but you know what I mean. Set a rally point somewhere outside where your students can meet you so that they all know at the end of your debate round, come back here. This is where I will be. Um, and then... Talk to them about their rounds. How did it go? Uh, what did the other team say? Oh, what did you say to that? Have you thought about this? Hey, don't forget to use this piece of evidence. Hey, there's this piece of evidence. And, and just drop little tips on them. And then help them stay on schedule. Oh my gosh, look at what time it is. It's the next round is starting. It's round two. Everybody go look at the pairings, right? Um, and help them find where they're supposed to be and get there, right? Uh, you know, and then obviously check to make sure you're picking up your ballot because if you are walking them all individually one at a time to their rooms and then you discover you have a ballot, uh, the tournament can't function until all of the judges have picked up their ballots and they're, they're all judging their debates. So, you know, check on that sort of thing. Um, those are the basic things that you can do at a tournament. And then you will obviously load them up after the awards ceremony at the end of the day and, and take them back home and make sure that they get back home safely to their parents and 
You know, I mean, that's a large part of what debate coaches do. They're the moral and intellectual support. They're the timekeepers uh, and the managers of their high school and middle school students all day. The day has ended, and now it is time for awards. So you'll shuffle all the students into the awards ceremony, and we'll read off the awards, and there are different sets of awards. There's team awards for how well they competed together in terms of their win-losses, and then there are speaker awards for how well they're doing individually. Um, you know, so there's two very different sets of awards. And then after all the awards are passed out, uh, over the course of the award ceremony, the Bay Area Urban Debate League is going to give you a folder full of ballots. And those ballots have the judge commentary for the day. Do not pass out the ballots at the award ceremony. Do not pass out the ballots at the award ceremony. There are judges and coaches uh, floating around who have just judged your teams. And my rule of thumb is the 50 feet rule. Always be at least 50 feet away from the tournament before giving students ballots because you don't know what they're going to say. And it's highly possible that that judge is going to come walking in at the next debate tournament and hear a student who just said a bunch of stuff about them because they weren't happy that they, they lost a debate. Um, you know, so 50 feet, that, and it's kind of like a cooling off period. Debaters need a cooling off period to sort of relax from the debate tournament. So usually I just put the ballots in my bag and then at the very next practice that we're all at, I show everybody the ballots and I let them read their ballots. Um, and then I really just enjoy the awards ceremony. You know, we clap for all the students and, and I teach them what it means to be a good sport. You clap for other people and you be excited when your friends win just as you would be excited when you win. Uh, and, um, you know, that's kind of what the award ceremony is about. And it, they're usually pretty fun and, and they're pretty exciting. So I, I recommend that you put the ballots in your bag and enjoy the award ceremony. Okay, the tournament is over. So the last part is sort of the follow-up of the tournament. Um, you're going to get a cumulative sheet. A cumulative sheet uh, looks like this. The cumulative sheet uh, basically has the list of your teams and then their scores and their win-loss, which is what all these numbers are, their scores and then their win-losses. So as you can see, the cum sheet is useful. It's really like a, a very simple document that tells you, um, you know, how everything went and it kind of lists everything in one place. And that's very useful because you want to send a, a follow-up email to your principal letting them know how you did at the tournament. And the cum sheet is the easiest way to get that information because it will have listed, you know, that so-and-so person got seventh speaker and such-and-such -such pair of people got third place team or whatever. Send those results to your principal. The principal wants to know. They're excited. They'll usually read them over the announcements um, or have them added to the announcements or to the, the, the school bulletin board or whatever. Um, and it's a cool thing. You know, it, it's it's fun to be successful, and this is a good way to keep your principal in the loop. And the, the league tries to do that, but we are so buried with stuff, usually we don't get to it. So this is the easiest way to assure that it happens. Uh, the other thing is now it's time for practice, so get out the ballots and give the students their ballots during practice. Now you may notice some of the ballots are missing. That happens. There's like some sort of gremlin that sits in the tab room during the tournament and just eats whole pieces of paper. I don't know where they go. I assure you, though, if we have the ballot, we gave you a copy of it. Uh, we actually have a person at the tournament who does nothing but make copies to put the ballot packs together. So uh, they do their best. Um, I assure you, we didn't keep it from you. So I, I don't know where it is. This is a short answer, but it happens at every tournament and, and all the time. And um I don't know. There's like, like I said, there's a gremlin that eats these. Um, the other thing to do is to list up on the board the arguments that your students struggle with, and then you could start setting up sort of a practice plan of attack. So, you know, oh, okay, well, we'll deal with these three arguments today, and then we'll deal with these other three arguments tomorrow, and or whenever we practice next, and sort of take it piece at a time. So you can actually use the things that your students struggle with to set up your next several practices, like were we struggling with cross-examination? Did we not know what to say when we were negative? Did we not know what to do in the second affirmative constructive? Right? Oh, we didn't know how to answer this disadvantage or this counter plan. We don't even know what a counter plan is. Or what is flowing? We don't know. Teach us, coach. Um, <laughs> you know, I really recommend the Novice Go Fight Win series on YouTube here. It's really great. 
way to watch some videos and get yourself ready to teach students on the quick and easy. Um, and that's basically a tournament in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found this informative. All right.